Imagine the scene. Dawn breaks on your last morning. A prison guard hands you a blank sheet of paper and a pen two hours before your execution by Nazi firing squad. You knew resistance had risks, but now? Well, now the war will continue without you and victory, victory is a dream you will never see. Your last letter, what do you write? Who do you write it to? What do you say? Because this is your last chance to say it. In today's episode, we explore the last letters written by members of the French resistance penned hours before their execution by Nazi firing squad during the Second World War. Love, fear, grief, regret, courage, bitterness, hope, and even joy. These are the emotions at the heart of the last letters. And a last letter is unlike any other type of writing. It peers into the soul of its author as the author confronts their mortality. With each word, time ticks second by second towards death, but with each word, a piece of the writer's soul lives on. I'm your host, James Patton Rogers. This is Warfare, and our guest today is Daniel Brunstetter, Professor of Political Science at the University of California, Davis. Daniel has spent years tracking down these letters and working with the families of those murdered to piece together their life, their death, and their acts of heroism. This is their story. This is their history. Daniel, tell us a bit about this topic. How did you go from being interested in the morality and ethics of drones and drone warfare to discovering this amazing cachet of last letters of resistance fighters from the Second World War? So it's actually kind of a story of chance encounters, if you will. I was just finishing up a book project on drones and the use of force that had taken me, oh, I would say about a decade too long to write. And uh, I had been living abroad in Bordeaux in France. I was actually the, there to do some research on the French drone program. I was walking to work one day and saw this used bookstore and thought I would pop in and see what they had. I was trying to connect with the local history. And they had a big section uh, on the Second World War. And as I was browsing through the section, a title captured my imagination. And the basic translation is, uh, life is to die for. And so I plucked it off the shelves started flipping through the pages, trying to see what it was. And I got to a page and I realized that these were letters written by members of the French resistance, hours, sometimes minutes before they were executed. And I started reading one particular letter. It was written by a 21 year old named Robert. Why did I stop at this letter? I don't know. Perhaps it's because unconsciously I thought that it meant something to me because my grandfather's name was Robert. And so I stopped this letter and in the bookstore read it. It was a letter to his mother saying he was going to be executed, saying farewell. And I get to the end and there's a PS. And the PS is this, I give you this butterfly wing to remember me by. And I stood there in the bookstore holding this book, completely moved, thinking to myself, what do I do with this? Because I'm not a, an expert on the Second World War and much less on the French resistance. Although I do have a connection to the Second World War, as my uncles were a part of that, my great uncles. And I do have a connection to France, uh, having uh, married into a French family. And so I felt like I wanted to do something with that. And so I, I picked up the book and it sat on my shelves unread until the pandemic hit. And during the pandemic, we were in France. It was a pretty uh, steep lockdown. We had uh, very few liberties. The idea of taking liberty away drew me back into the auspices of the era. And we had about an hour every day in which we could go out into the streets. And I realized that the streets all around me were named after members of the resistance. And on one end was this war memorial to all the dead from the First and Second World War. And then on the other end of this, I could walk a circular kilometer according to the French legal rules of lockdown. And at the other end, it was bordered by the Place des Martyrs de la Résistance, the Place of the Martyrs of the Resistance. So I was literally circumscribed by members of the resistance. And I started a daily ritual of reading at random one of these letters, because the book had maybe 120 letters. I didn't know how long we were going to be in lockdown. So I started reading them one by one. And then I wanted to learn more and delve deeper into the epic, into the era, into the tumult, as it were, and started uh, from there. 
Tell us a little bit about that period that they were fighting. You know, we all know about the French resistance, the bravery that had to be involved to try and resist against a force that had occupied your country, overtaken, overwhelmed your entire military and political establishments within a matter of six weeks. It must have felt hopeless. And we can place ourselves in that moment and we can think, oh, what would have we done? And and a lot of us would like to think, you know, we would have taken up the cause and been resistance fighting. But just what was it like to be in the resistance during this tumultuous period of occupation when the threat of death was all around? It's a very hard question to answer, a very good question to ask. I think the first thing we need to do when we think about that moment is to put ourselves in the moment of transition from when France used to be a free country that was fighting. Many of the, the last letter writers, they were mobilized to fight in the drôle de guerre, sort of the phony war as it was called. A phony war, yet 90,000 French soldiers died in the initial invasion. And when the armistice was signed, there was a sigh of relief from some that they were going to avoid the terrible, terrible losses of the First World War. And that they were somehow going to maintain some semblance of French identity despite the occupation. And, And as you well know, France was divided into two sections in the north, which was occupied by the Nazi German army. And then the south was run by the Vichy regime. That would change later on during the course of the war. But at this point, there was an attempt to go back to some semblance of normality. And so soldiers were demobilized. They went back to their jobs. Uh, Students went back to school. The rhythms of life picked up again. And people tried to realize, how do we get on with our lives? Um, How do we deal with this occupation? What if we want to resist? What could we possibly do? Of course, at that time, the BBC gets involved quite early. You'll know very well of Charles de Gaulle's famous speech on the 18th of June and the flame of the resistance shall never die and all of that. Absolutely. We'll come back to the BBC later on because they play a part in the story of the last letters. So Charles de Gaulle wants to show that there's part of France that's resisting, that's still fighting. And he calls on people in France to make that choice. But it's not an easy choice, as you say, because there is an occupation going on. The French army has been defeated. And the return to normal isn't really a return to normal because there are new laws that have taken into place that severely restrict liberties that we once had. So you can imagine there's no freedom of press anymore. There's no longer the right to go out in the streets and protest. You can't listen to foreign radio. Many of the the free press that used to operate was shut down. There was attempts to try to get academics like you and me to fall in line with the new uh, values of the regime and of the occupation. And so everyone who lived during that time had to face these existential questions. And what do we do? And let's be clear there as well, Daniel. You know, while the North is occupied by the Nazi regime and the South is under Vichy control, Vichy is still a puppet regime of the Nazis and is very much invoking and enforcing the laws that are put forward to them by the Nazi regime. And that's really important to showcase because in many of the instances, it's not the Nazis that arrest the resistance fighters, but it's the French police and they hand them over to the Germans to be executed. And so you have to think that as the oppression gets stronger and stronger, people start to make the choice to resist and they get fed up. And so one of the first major manifestations, to use the French word, or protest is on November 11th which, of course, is Armistice Day, um, and it celebrates the French victory over the Germans in World War I. But during the occupation, it was no longer a holiday. So the students, they descend into the streets, and that leads to arrests. And the Germans want to set an example that this isn't the way to go about living through the occupation. And so the first executions actually start taking place in November of 1940. They're trying to set an example to showcase their authority and their control. And that sets people on edge. People are uncomfortable with that. You can imagine, like, the first execution in Paris takes place on the 23rd of December, 1940. And the Nazis, they post posters on the metro, on the city walls. Jacques Bonsargent, who wrote a last letter, by the way, one to his mother and one to his friends, who was arrested and executed. Things remain in that stable state of occupation and angst until Operation Barbarossa, in the summer of 1941, Operation Barbarossa, when the Germano-Soviet pact was ruptured as Nazi Germany invaded Russia. Absolutely. Hitler turns on Stalin, and you have a whole new front of the war opening up. And that new front of the war opens a new front of the French resistance. Up until that point, the Communist Party had been somewhat in limbo, trying to toe the party line. 
and not go against the Nazi occupiers. Now, there were some members of the Communist Party who were challenging what Stalin was saying in the orders from Moscow, but they weren't overtly attacking the occupation. But once uh, Operation Barbarossa begins, that politics changes, and we start to see open armed resistance by the Communist Party against Nazi occupying forces. So that's interesting, Daniel. Were the communist political groups in France left alone by the Vichy and the Nazi regime while there was that uneasy alliance between Stalin and Hitler? No, not at all. In fact, they went underground, actually, because they were ah. uh, barred from political participation. And so they were an illegal party. And so if you were a communist, you could be arrested for your communist inklings. And in fact, many of, of the leading members of the Communist Party were, in fact, arrested early on in the occupation, languishing in various different prison camps, many of those would come to be executed later on. And some of them would write very famous last letters. I see. So, but it was Barbarossa that kind of acts as a catalyst to drawing them to arms. Exactly. So once the word from Moscow was that you were at war with Nazi Germany, then that opened up the possibility to officially take up armed resistance. And they did with vigor. And so the first major attacks are, are assassinations on German officers in August of 1941. There are a series of attacks. And these attacks are a catalyst for an increase in the oppression by the Nazi occupiers. And so what they do is they, Otto von Stupenhagel, who's the military commander in France, he creates a new law and it's called the La Politique des Otages, the, the politics of hostages. And I'm going to read to you the announcement that he makes on the 21st of August. I'll quote, on the 21st of August, 1941, in the morning, a member of the German army was the victim of an assassination in Paris. As a consequence, I order, one, as of August 23rd, every Frenchman who is arrested, whether by the German authorities in France or by the French, are considered to be hostages. Two, in the event of a new act, a number of hostages corresponding to the gravity of the criminal acts will be shot. And so what this effectively does is it means that anyone who is in prison is effectively having a death sentence hanging over them because the Communist Party isn't going to stop its attacks. They're going to ramp up their attacks in the coming days and weeks. And the German occupying forces are going to respond with mass executions. But before we get there, I want to hold that pause because the hostages are one kind of person who's executed. There's another kind of person who's executed, and those who are, are actually those who undertake armed resistance. So many of the otages, the hostages, they were just members of the Communist Party. Maybe they were resisting by passing out clandestine tracts or writing Vs on the wall in protest of the occupation or protesting in the streets, or listening to foreign radio, or this and that. So they weren't necessarily undertaking armed resistance, but because they were communists, they were considered part of the enemy. Others who were eventually executed actually did form resistance groups. They took up arms, or were undertaking reconnaissance missions, or sometimes undertaking acts of sabotage, derailing trains, etc., etc., there were lots of small groups that formed kind of spontaneously all over France. But if you wanted to divide the resistance into two major groups, it would be the communists and the Gaullists. So those who followed the communist ideology and those who followed the speech of Charles de Gaulle, fighting for a free France. And I want to tell the story of one of those who did follow Charles de Gaulle's call. And it's an interesting story because it ends up with him writing a last letter. So, so when Charles de Gaulle calls on June 18th for members of the French military and citizens in France to follow him. He's pretty much alone, but he wants to continue the fight. And one such person, Honoré Étienne d'Orbe, who is a military commander in the French Navy, does just that. He chooses, he, I think he was in Djibouti at the time, so he was abroad, and he tries to convince some of his fellow seamen to undertake a journey to join Charles de Gaulle in London. And he's met with some resistance. Some want to do it. Others don't. And so he chooses part of his crew. He goes to find de Gaulle in London and becomes part of the, the Free French Forces. And he's tasked with going to France, occupied France, to set up the first radio station so that people could communicate with de Gaulle from France. And he forms this resistance group called Nemrod. And he goes with three other people, or two other people, so they're three all together. And they're operating in France, and they're first to set up this 
radio networks so that they could contact London, but they're betrayed. They're betrayed by an infiltrator who turns them over to the Germans and they languish in prison. There's a trial and all three of them are condemned to death. And so while he's in prison, Honoré writes a series of letters. He keeps a journal. He writes to his wife. And then the day comes in August of 1941 when he's to be executed. And he's granted permission actually to write four last letters. Most of the time, you could only write three or sometimes you only had time to write one. And sometimes you weren't even given the permission at all. And so he, for some reason, was able to write four. He wrote one to the German priest because he was a very Catholic person who attended to the final rites. He wrote one to his sister, one to his wife, and one, which I find very interesting, to his friend in the military, Paul. And in this letter, he explains why he chose to follow de Gaulle and to resist. And it's a very significant and interesting letter. You have to imagine the scene, like this is moments before he's about to be executed. It's his last chance to explain his motivations and to tell people why he's doing what he's doing. And so he puts pen to paper and he writes this beautifully flowing letter that explains all of his moral choices. My dearest Paul, since the end of May, I had decided that if I were to be shot by a firing squad, it would be to you that I would write to say farewell to my friends in the Navy. And so it has come to pass that, for three months, you actively took care of me. I thank you from the bottom of my heart and I ask you to transmit my respectful sentiments to the Admiral Darlon. I feel united by the heart with you, and that has been of great comfort to me. I so loved the Navy, as much for the interesting life aboard and the joys it gives me. As for the friendships of comrades and the affection of the men, I have not left it. I have not left our ship the Duquesne, the 10th of July 1940, without being torn apart. But that ship, like the whole squadron, was decommissioned. Our government no longer seemed to me to be independent. To continue the fight, it was for me to follow the path that we traced for us. I looked for the way to do so under the flag of France. I left for Somalia. When I saw the operation were suspended there, I joined up with the French Free Forces. What I want to say is that there, like all the comrades with whom I found myself in company, I did nothing more than serve France and that in a very independent manner. Our host understood us perfectly and did not influence us in any way. To come to France, I needed to overcome significant opposition to the idea. I was pushed to do so by no one but myself. I believe, mon vieux Pépin, to have in all that I have done, served France and only France. I think that my friends will understand that, and that one will wish to consider me comme mort pour elle, dead for her. It is my greatest wish. I would like to tell you so much about the destiny I wish for France. I am persuaded that we see each of us her renovation heading along the same path. It will be good of you to ask, by way of Fatou, the German authorities, the names of the Breton sailors condemned in my affair. They are excellent patriots, and they deserve to be taken care of. A 75-year-old guy in particular has now done his time. Try to have them sent back home. I am not able to continue to write because they put us in the same cell. The two comrades that are to be shot by firing squad tomorrow and me, and we are passing the time telling jokes. Also, I say farewell, my Pépin, my brother. I load you with my affection for Pouchette, for Marcel and his wife, and with my profound friendship for all our friends. Later, you will see Eliane and my sister. I embrace you. Vive la France. Honoré. That is an incredibly moving, emotive letter, Daniel. And it gets me thinking, of course... Hopefully, eventually, these will end up with their families and who they wanted them to be sent to. But were they ever intercepted along the way? There were two kinds of last letters. So the ones that were written clandestinely that maybe were snuck out with a fellow prisoner or sometimes given to a priest who, who would take them to the families and deliver them. Sometimes they were thrown from trains as, or from, from a bus as they were being driven to the execution site. So those kinds of letters, depend, their survival depended on the goodwill of whoever found them. The other kinds of letters went through official channels. So the prisoner would write the letter, 
Then it would go to the German censors. Sometimes they would censor passages. Sometimes they would never deliver the letters. But sometimes they would. And so in the case of Honoré, his letter goes to Ernst Jünger, who you may know as a German officer. He was a military officer at the time overseeing the execution. He was a World War veteran, famous author who wrote about his experiences in World War I as a German soldier. And the letter comes to his desk. And he writes in his journal, I read this afternoon the farewell letter by Count Estienne d'Ovre, which was delivered to me by his lawyer. They constitute a reading of immense value. I had the feeling of holding in my hands a document that would persist. I try to imagine the scene. I find this career officer, these two career officers meeting, one through his last words and the other through reading those words, to be a different story, one that we don't always hear when we think about these executions. So Junger is trying to imagine, what would he do with these words? They're going to last, they're going to persist despite the war. And it's almost like there's a certain moral equality between them, even though they're on enemy sides, that they're fighting for their countries. We might reject that by saying, well, Junger is fighting for the Nazis in Etienne Dora is fighting for the free French. But between the two of them, there seems to be this mutual respect. And in some of the, the work that you and I have done on the ethics of war, we might you know, talk about the moral equality of soldiers. And it doesn't matter if you're fighting on the just or unjust side, but there's that sense of, of respect between you. And Junger, I think he's, Junger to pronounce it the German way, I think he sees that respect. And the idea that this letters, these words are going to remain is a powerful one. And This is not the only letter that comes across his desk. In fact, many, many letters across the, the early stages of the war come across his desk. And he does more than just read them. He actually translates them into German for his own personal records. And I'm wondering to myself, why does he do that? You know, is he thinking that these could be of some use after the war, assuming a German victory? That maybe they would be a testament to... to fallen fellow soldiers who fought for their cause and that we could honor them after the war? Well, this is somebody who has written a book on his experience of the First World War, understands the importance of keeping that memory alive, even if the soldiers themselves or the resistance fighters have passed. So maybe it's more than just a fraternity among those who serve, but also among those who write and see the importance of the written word. I think that's very true. I think that the idea of the written word as having longevity is what makes these letters really powerful and impactful. They take on what I like to call lives beyond the actual writing of the letter themselves. So once the author writes them and, and it leaves his hand, then it depends on the courses of fortune and history as to where the letters go. And in this case, the letter ends up with Ernst Junger and he has this moment of respect, but the letter also goes elsewhere. And it's interesting to know the story of this letter because it is sent to London and read aloud on the BBC. And we'll get to that in a moment. But before we do, I want to come back to this because there are two other parts to this, to this specific story that tell us a little bit more about the different fate of some of the letters and their lives. And the first is the story of one of the other people who was executed alongside. And his name is Maurice Barrier. He wrote a letter to, and it didn't become famous. It's not in any of the volumes that I came across. I only learned of it because the family, family friend sent it to me. And the family friend put me in touch with Maurice Barlier's daughter, who was young, lived during the war, lived through the war, lived through the execution of her father. And we spoke on the phone one day. She was 80 some odd years old. And I wanted to know what she had to say about this letter and it's the importance to her and the memory of it. And she told me the story that after her father's execution, she brought the letter to school to share. You can imagine an innocent child who's just lost her father goes and wants to share the letter, maybe seeking some sort of uh, counsel, or forgiveness, or, or some sort of comforting. But she receives icy silence. And she told me that she realized that the most important thing to do was to remain silent. So she never spoke of the letter again during the occupation. And the letter became part of her family's story, but it didn't become part of the public sphere. And so these two letters 
are very much contrasted in the way the one becomes part of the public sphere as part of the military bravada, the relationships between enemies. And then it gets sent to the BBC to be read aloud to occupied France. And the other is just a family memento that it was met with silence. And so those two contrasting fates I find to be deeply moving. And is that a typical story when you've been looking through the last letters? For example, would it be the same kind of circumstance when talking about the communist resistance fighters? So here we get into the lives of the letters. As I said earlier, the letters aren't just for intimate purposes. So the the original purpose of the letter writer is, I think, to share their final thoughts with their loved ones. So if you imagine the scene, you're about to be executed Someone puts a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil in front of you. What do you write? Who do you write to? Is there a genre of last letter writing to follow? Some scholars have said, yes, there is a genre. My sense is that there isn't really a genre, despite the patterns we might see across the letters, that each individual search inside themselves to say what has to be said. Because last letters are like no other correspondence, you'll never get a chance to say something again. Whatever you don't say, you take to the grave. And so the letter writers, I think that they look to the various things that have shaped their lives. So for some, it's religion. For others, it's their party, the Communist Party. For all, it's the love that they've shared with family, with loved ones, with friends. Those experiences, those emotions permeate every single letter. And the letter writers, they always take a moment to express their love to to these people who they might have seen. And some of the letters, they're incredibly tragic because you have one letter writer whose who's partner is pregnant. And so he's writing to a, a child he'll never know. You have another letter writer who's writing to his infant daughter and saying, I only held you in my arms for 10 minutes, but now I have to die and later you'll understand why. And so these incredibly moving instances where you see a, you know, a father making that choice of great sacrifice to resist so that their children sometime in the future can have better lives. And, and these letters, they, they permeate family circles, they permeate family histories, they leave scars. But the letters that enter the public sphere have different lives. And the Communist Party actually was one of the prime motivators of sharing letters. So when the letters were delivered, whether through official channels or clandestinely, many went to work right away to copy these letters and redistribute them so that more in the public sphere could hear these words. And so the communists sometimes printed them in clandestine tracts. So if you look through the historical records, you see all these clandestine newspapers that have traces of the the last letters so that people in the public sphere would know the final words of their compatriots. One letter writer actually cites uh, the letter of someone who was executed, which seems to suggest that he had read it somewhere in a tract. And so the letters were all about if you knew where to look for them. I should talk about two important instances where these lives, the letters, affect the war, impact the war. I see. So it's not only the emotional, perhaps the recruitment drive that comes from these letters being released, but there's some actual kind of tangible impact on the war itself. There is. And the letters become markers of memory. They become words of motivation, words of solace, words of inspiration. Let's talk first about markers of memory. There's a a very conscious decision early on, almost immediately after these executions take place, to conserve whatever material one has their hands on or one can get their hands on for future memory construction after the war. And so there's a call on the BBC in early 1942, I think, uh, in which the BBC calls out to occupied France and say, keep records, keep everything you have so that we can build a monument after the war. And the last letters are part of that monument. So families they, who receive these letters, they many of them take this really seriously. And so they want the final words of their, their sons and fathers and brothers uncles, grandfathers sometimes. It's important to note that there's incredible diversity in the corpus of last letters. The youngest letter writer is 16, the oldest in his 70s. And is it men and women as well, Daniel? Or is this mainly men who are executed in France at the hand of the Nazis? The corpus of the letters, which is probably some 700 letters, 
Not everyone had the opportunity to write letters, and not everyone has shared those letters, and many were lost. Of the maybe 10,000 executions during the course of the war, only 700 letters remain or are in the public sphere or have been shared. And so that gives you kind of an idea of, of how many people wrote the letters. But to your question about was it men or women, the letters, the corpus of letters is almost exclusively men. I've only found three women. And there's a reason for that. The reason for that is that the Nazis, they didn't believe women deserve the honor, the military honors of writing last letters. So writing the last letters was considered a kind of military privilege and honor given to someone. And only men deserve that honor. And so women were actually an important part of the resistance. And you see this in all the documents if you study the resistance closely. For example, in the first book of last letters that was compiled during the war, it was published in London in, in 1943. It's called Mort pour la France, Dead for France. In the preface of that book, the anonymous author points out that women accompanied men in all stages of the resistance. And yet there are only three last letters that I found. And one was by this woman named Olga who was deported. And she threw her letter out of the, the, the bus transporting her back to prison to be decapitated by an axe. And so that was delivered to the Red Cross and then found its way to the family eventually, which is an incredible story in and of itself. And so it's almost entirely men. The women, they were, they were deported in, in what the Germans called Nacht in Nubel, night in fog. It was a policy to essentially disappear people. And the women, most of them were deported to concentration camps, the most sinister being the Ravensbrück work camp, of which more than half never came back. It's interesting, I want to read you a quote, since you brought it up, that fits back with the Honoré Ernst Jünger story. And there are voices, and there, one of the voices that I want to point out is by um, Agnès Humbert. So she was an early member of the resistance from the very beginning, and she was in prison in the cell next to Honoré de Tindor. She writes in her diary after the war her account of when he was taken off to be executed. And this is what she says. We followed with our ears the sound of the boots made by his escort all the way down the corridor in the stairwell where they resonated so loudly. At that moment, we sang Ce n'est qu'un au revoir to the tune of old Lang Syne. We never knew if he heard us. So what this shows is that there was a sense of camaraderie and that women were imprisoned side by side, the men, and they just suffered different fates. And she survived the war. She was deported to one of the, the work camps, but survived. And you have testimonies from, from many women. I could cite other passages where they're side by side, but they're part of this resistance group and everyone gets captured at some point and they're in prison and the men are executed and the women are deported. And one of the interesting stories is the stories of young mothers as to why, why would you, as a mother, risk your child's life? And w one of, um, her name was Giselle, she writes in her memoir, the reason we did this and we had conversations in prison about whether we should and there was debate. And she says, the reason most women did this is because they didn't want to raise their children as fascists. And it was better to die trying to create a better world than to, to succumb to fascism and the education that their children would have growing up in fascist France. And so they were willing to risk everything, including their own lives and that of their children for a better future. And that's really powerful. It doesn't come out in last letters because they weren't given that. But if you, if you dig deeper into some of these memoirs, which brings us really back to the tumult of the times, you find those traces well, you mentioned, Daniel, just how powerful these letters are, and that's clear for all of us to hear. But as you mentioned, the BBC appears to have realised this as well. So tell us about just how important, you know, you're talking about the lives of these letters. How important were the letters when they started to be broadcast across the channel, around the world, by the BBC? The BBC played a really important role in the occupation and in the formation of the resistance. From Charles de Gaulle's speech on the 18th of June to the liberation, the BBC had episodes every single day called Les Français par le Français and another one called Honneur et Patrie. These episodes every day sent news, stories, 
to occupied France. Now you have to imagine what it's like living in occupied France at the time. You can't listen to foreign news sources. The, the Vichy and Nazi propaganda machines were very, very powerful. And so the French radio was only broadcasting pro Vichy and pro occupation news. And there was no other source of news. And that shapes a narrative of the conflict in which the judo Bolsheviks are the enemy, that the communists are out for destroying the world, that the Americans are imperialists, that the British don't really uh, want your well-being. And so that was the story. And so whenever the British or the Americans bombed targets in occupied France, it was always a, a focus of the propaganda to point out the casualties and that they were bombing you, the poor French, and they don't want any your liberation, they want your destruction, and so on and so forth. And so the BBC was a source of alternative news for those who had access to radio in occupied France. And it became a ritual for many that you have to, you know, you could go on the internet and, and hear sort of that crackling sound of the BBC radio tuning up and you, you see pictures of uh, people huddled around a radio listening for news because that was their only source of outside information. Even news within France didn't travel necessarily from village to village because of you needed a pass to an Ausweis to go from here to there. There was the demarcation line. It was hard to travel. And so the BBC was a powerful source of alternative information. And they used the last letters for multiple purposes. First, they use it to try to, to show that there's unity. So I mentioned Etienne Dava. He was a, a Gaullist, a staunch uh, supporter of Charles de Gaulle. There was another who was executed named Gabriel Perry, who was a communist deputy, and he was also executed as an otage. And the BBC pairs their two letters together in an episode to say, despite coming from distinct backgrounds, despite one being a Catholic, a fervent Catholic Gaullist, and the other being an atheist communist, they unite in their last letters and say essentially the same thing, that they're dying for France. And this call for unity is an attempt to show that there is, despite ideological differences, a common ground to the resistance. And it's shaky across the war, but the BBC keeps trying through, through the letters to preserve that unity. And they do it numerous times. And it sets a pattern. A famous French poet describes the pattern this way. Uh, celui qui croit au ciel et celui qui croit pas. He who believes in the heavens and he who does not. And so it's the pairing of a Gaullist and a communist together to show the multiple facets of the resistance. And it starts with that initial episode and almost every single episode across the BBC, there are seven or eight at least that I found in, in the archives that I looked at, always have these pairings of a communist and a Gaullist. And that unity breaks down after the war. So after the liberation, there, of course, is a struggle for political power. Who's going to be able to impose their vision of what France should look like? And the Gaullists and the communists don't see eye to eye on anything. But at least in terms of during the war, there's this projection of unity through the letters. Well, you see, that's really interesting, because one thing we know about post-war France is that there had to almost be this creation of a myth that everybody was in the French resistance, that it wasn't a matter of collaborator versus resistance fighter. They had to try and rebuild a country. And one of the ways of doing that was to kind of clean the slate and rebuild with this new national narrative. Did these letters disappear during that period or did they come back and have a new life as this kind of uniting call that France had always been one force and had finally been liberated? I wish that had been the case, but it turns out that it's not. So at the end of the war, there was this political struggle for who would rebuild France. And the Communist Party used the letters to show that they played, in their view, the most significant role in the resistance, in the armed resistance elite. That was the narrative they painted. In fact, they called themselves the party of the 75,000 fusillés, or executed by the firing squad, which is an exaggeration to be sure. There weren't 75,000 communists who were executed, but the idea was to play up their part in the armed resistance. And so as early as 1946, they published a volume of collected last letters, 71 last letters. It's called Lettres des Fusillés. And it's interesting because the preface of that book is also a call for unity. 
everyone had their part in the resistance. The communists played a really important role as we reforged, because this 1946 was the election and the referendum on the new constitution. There was a lot of hope that the communist party would be part of that. And so that first edition is all about hope and, and unity that's sort of, that still come from the idealism of the war. That breaks down pretty quickly because the communists don't become part of the government in the way that they want to. And they become a secondary player. They become a party that's not part of the ruling coalition for the next decades. And so the next edition comes out in 1958, which is, you know, a tumultuous time with Charles de Gaulle back in power. And, and that preface is very much about, oh, you know, we were the only ones in the resistance. We need to fight to, to regain what we've not been part of. And you need to look to rebuild France and, and fight against the dictator that is de Gaulle. And so it's a very different manipulation of the last letters. And it's interesting because if you read the letters, they change some of the letters. They edit the letters in these volumes from the originals to make their heroes sound stronger. God, isn't that tragic? You start to have them used as propaganda, and instead of trying to unite, they're used to divide. But if you start to look at the lasting memories, I suppose the the scars of these letters, one could be division within France itself. But I know that you've met with a number of the families. How do the families view these letters? Do they treasure them, or are they something, a source of just great sadness? Both. I think the letters are many things to many people. Let me tell a story about the BBC during the war that gives you an idea of what the letters meant to the families and how they could be a motivating factor. And it's one of the lives of the letters that fits into the narrative of resistance. And remember, this is during the war. It takes place in 1943. A woman named Lucienne, who was a member of the resistance from the early days, she helped to down the pilots, evade capture, and help them get on a train or some uh, follow through the network to the Pyrenees, cross Spain, and then go back to England to fly again. And so she was part of a resistance group up in Breton, which is in the northwest corner of France, from the early days. And so she has a deep desire to follow de Gaulle and to free France. It turns out that her brother was executed by the Nazis. And she was the one at home who received the last letter when it was delivered, the actual envelope with his words, and read it and opened it. And it was a very traumatic experience for her. And at one point, she's so fed up and she she wants to do more. And she doesn't want to be around people who are are sympathizing with the Nazis. She wants to go to London. And so a 20-something young member of the resistance decides to go to London and she carries her brother's last letter in her pocket. So she she goes on a fisher boat with a downed pilot and 17 other people trying to cross the channel, undertakes a 24-hour journey, crosses the channel, goes to London and meets up with Maurice Schumann, who's the voice of the BBC. And he hosts her on the BBC in early 1943. And their exchange is a really incredible call for resistance. And maybe we can listen to it now. I have for the first time seen, touched, read the actual last letter penned by the very end of one of our martyrs. Not the copy, but the letter itself. The paper upon which the palm perched with such strength. This letter is the sister of the martyr herself, who has come from France, from the Breton region. To bring it to us, her name is Lucienne. Today, Lucienne is here, before me in person, after a perilous journey that will inspire any young heart when it will be permitted to tell. It was you who received one evening at home this envelope with his own writing, his... Next to, as a friendly neighbor, the stem from their felt commandant tour. Theirs, you open it, like you open it now. You recognize the razor careless done stroke of his own writing. Without a doubt, his, next to their grease spot, caused by them, because after having tortured him, they dirtied him even as far as his last letter. And as he wrote it without showing a sign of weakness, you read it, without showing sign of weakness. Dearest Mama, Sister and Cousins, I will be executed tonight, without having been able to see you. I saw the priest and received communion, and it will be the German chaplain who will attend to me until the very last moment. My final thought will be for you. I am at peace. 
with God and the world. Love and kisses to all. Farewell, your son, brother, cousin. I have peace with God and the world. Voilà. Who cries that none of his executioners will have the right to utter before dying. In addition, when those who saw him die speak of him, it seems like they are afraid. They are right to be afraid. It is your brother who will have the last word. Do you hear, Mama? He will have the last word. I do not have to implore you to be courageous. Courage you have. You know that just as that died in the first world, he did not die for nothing. What you lack, just maybe, sometimes, is patience. But you see that I arrived safely. Live in the anticipation of the day that you will see me return with the General de Gaulle and among his soldiers. Because soon, it will be on a uniform that I wear my Logan Cross. The BBC were obviously doing a fantastic job to try and drum up support, but when was it broadcast? At what point during the war did it make a difference? So this is at a point of the war in 1943 when one might say that in France people were becoming a bit frustrated. Sort of, The war had been dragging on. The BBC kept account of the number of days under occupation with every new episode, and that number just kept getting higher and higher and higher. And so if you imagine listening in occupied France, you're saying, okay, well, when, is, when are things going to change? And so 1943 runs its course. Some significant events happen in 1943. I believe the invasion of Sicily happens. And so there's some movement in which the tide of the war is changing. And it becomes apparent that the Nazis probably aren't going to be able to hold on forever. And that maybe victory is going to happen sooner rather than later. But the French had heard this before. And so as the year ticks down and winter sets in, There's another November 11th episode which talks about, we know all of you in France are suffering. We know that you are waiting for the débarquement, the invasion of France. It's going to happen. We just tell you to be patient. But you can imagine that the French, they'd heard this before. Be patient. Yeah, okay, well, we're the ones who are suffering from food rations. It's winter here in France. We can't heat our homes. Executions are happening all around us. And by the way, this is deep into the time in which Jews are being rounded up and deported. Uh, if you dive into the diaries of the day and the historical reports, you, you hear terrible stories about that. And the French are aware of that. And not only that, in January 43 at the Casablanca conference, the decision had been made that the Allies would pursue unconditional surrender. And as part of that, the bombing campaign had been ramped up. So there would have been increased amounts of destruction in the region as well. And the French know this and they suffer from this and they're looking for some signs of hope and they're starting to lose that hope. And so taking all this context into mind, the BBC prepares an episode on Christmas Day in 1943. So you, you imagine Christmas during the occupation, you get together with family if you can, the mood is perhaps not festive, but you want it to be festive, you, you maybe try to find some butter to create some cakes, maybe you have some wine that you've been saving or, or some other beverage. Searching for normality in any way you can. Exactly. And you want a sign of hope. And the BBC reads this and they prepare this Christmas episode in 1943 that they read aloud. And I, I like to imagine what it would be like to tune in after a Christmas meal in the evening, turn on the radio and listen. And let's do just that. I reread this night the anthology already so vast of the last letters of the executed otage and martyrs Prepare tomorrow that thing, says the one named Perry. I'm tomorrow, you are yesterday, cries out the other to his assassins. At each line, an accent of victory, the pride of having elevated and purified the flame before passing on the torch. One barely dared to say, but it all too true, a sort of joie de vivre that drowns in the pride to die. Hear a letter from Tony Blancourt, a communist who came from Haiti, addressed to his parents, executed the 9th of March, 1942. 
I have the certitude that the world of tomorrow will be better and more just, that the humble and the meek will live with more dignity, more humanely. For this sacred cause, it is less hard to give my life, that the life of my younger brother be not selfish, that he give to his fellows, whatever their race, whatever their opinion, all that I have in love, power flows to you. Another letter by a 20-year-old Catholic whose name we do not know, executed the 2nd August 1943. It is a story of a few minutes for me. It is more painful for you, and the worst of it is that there is nothing I can do to ease this pain. Farewell, comrades, friends, all of those who need me thundering and singing. For me, the war is over. It is up to you not to finish it with a flourish and to end it forever. World of yesterday, why to live? Power well, of love, finish the war well en beauté. Tomorrow, beauty, love, variation on the same call, always the same plea. Life is beautiful, shouted by those who are losing it. By those who are strong enough to give it to us, who often are weak enough to find it so sad and ugly. And yet, it is they who speak the truth. Because it is they who are witnesses to the truth. Yes, it is a spiritual dimension. To overly issue the bread of tears. How can we forget, since they themselves did not forget, that a world of pain is a world being born? A death that has meaning is more alive than a life that does not. From that broadcast, we can see that the BBC is trying to generate hope and trying to convince the French people that not only is there a future for them, but they can start to look to the future. And we know that as we move through to 44, the war becomes incredibly different. There is hope that is injected into French society. So what happens to the letters as the war starts to come to an end? First of all, 1944 is going to be a very violent year in France. In the build-up to D-Day, there are attempts to create more resistance cells. There's more acts of sabotage. People really want to get into the fight. And the oppression by the Nazis is going to be ramped up even higher. And so there are more and more executions. And between December 1943 and August 25th, when Paris is liberated, Hundreds of letters will be written. Hundreds of executions will take place. But there is a sense that victory is on the way, that victory will arrive and that it's inevitable. And people want to be part of that fight. And we know the history. We know that it happens. And Paris is liberated to great fanfare in August. And then the Allied armies march across France, liberating most of the rest of France in 1944 and early 1945 and then into Germany. And then the war ends. And as we mentioned earlier, there's an attempt to use the letters to rebuild, to tell certain narratives about who did what during the resistance, to create vectors of historical memory that will give influence over politics. And that's only one part of the story. Another part of the story is the personal part of the story, the scars that the letters left, the the absences that are marked by these letters where an uncle, a brother, a father should have been. I mentioned before that you have had the chance to meet with the families and, and like you said, you've been able to speak over the phone with some of those related to the resistance fighters. What was it like meeting with the families? And it must have been surprising for them to hear that this academic, this American French academic, wants to find out more about this family history that must have felt like a lifetime ago. There was a sense of surprise that an American would be interested. But then there was also a sense of relief and joy combined together that somehow these letters could be spread to the Anglophone audience. What I did during the lockdown is I contacted the Mont Valérien Museum. And the Mont Valérien is the fortress outside of Paris where most of the executions took place in the glade inside the fortress. Over a thousand executions took place, and, and this is an old lieu de mémoire, a high place of, of national memory. And so I contacted them and asked them if they would be willing to put me in contact with any of the families. 
And so they put out a call and I met with Jocelyne Poncelet. And her father, his name was Henri. And he was in the resistance with his brother, Roger. And one of them made it and one of them didn't. I had never encountered Roger's letter before. This was sort of early in my research. And so when we spoke on the phone, she read it to me in, in haste over the phone. And then we agreed that we would meet together in Paris for a lunch. And so we sat down at the restaurant in perfect liberty, right? In freedom, more or less, because of course around us all, France was in uproar with the, the anti-COVID protests in the streets, the manifestation and the sirens and the police and the riot tear gas and all of that. But we were in our cozy little Paris restaurant enjoying the freedoms of liberty. And she hands me some documents. And one of those documents is a letter, except it's a fragment. And so it's a triangular in shape. The upper right-hand corner of what was once a page is missing. The ink is indigo, flowing. It was obviously the handwriting of Roger. And there were passages that were missing. There was a crease in the middle, so obviously it had been folded and stored somewhere. I didn't know where. And so I'm there trying to read the letter fragment. And Jocelyn is sort of filling in the blanks for me. And she gave me permission to share the letter, to have it read out loud with all of you. Fren, 23 October 43. Dearest parents and everyone, it is nine o'clock. We were just informed that our Recours de Grâce appeal for clemency was rejected. Dearest parents, I ask you, with my last wishes, to be courageous. I know that your pain will be deep. One single hope animates us. Our sacrifice will not be in vain. The previous time, dearest parents, you asked for forgiveness because of the education that you gave me. Dearest Papa, I have but one thing to say to you. You do not need to be sorry. I do not regret anything. I dedicated myself to a cause that will render our country happy. One thing makes me sad. The grief that you will have. Dearest Papa, direct all of your tenderness to little Christian. He will be the first replacement. Dearest Maman, forgive me for I was often unjust with you. Dearest Mémère, your grief will be extreme, I know. Such is war that never generates anything good. I kiss you one last time. Adieu. Dearest Henri, I wish you better luck than me. Dearest uncles, aunts and cousins, adieu. Dearest brothers and sisters, think of all of us who will die for the happiness of the world's youth. Dearest parents, I kiss you one last time. With all my heart of a grateful son, adieu. Forgive the grief. Courage. France will triumph. Long live the fighting people. Your son, Roger. My last moments are for you. When we are reunited in the grave, it will be for my party. I think the letter meant a lot to the family. You know, growing up, she'd never met Roger, and so she'd been to various memorial services, but didn't really become interested until later in life. So it was a part of her orbit, like it was for any of the famille de fusillés, uh, the resistance, the absence of of these people who should have been uncles or fathers or or grandfathers, because if they'd gone on their normal lives, they, they would have been part of all of these family circle celebrations. But they were absent, and so that absence was felt. She told me that the letter was a scar, and that in our discussion there was a, a sense of, on the one hand, great sacrifice. The spirit of humanism that permeates the letter is very meaningful to her and to her family that Roger gave his life for others so that we could live in a better world. He had an imagination of what that world would look like, and maybe we might not always all agree with the the different ideologies that permeated the world at the time, but he really fought and died for a better France, for a better humanity. And that comes across in the love of his family, but also the the broader universalist, humanist ideals that the letter exposes. But to go back to the letter itself, 
Jocelyn told me a little bit about its own history. And she told me that the original was lost. And so what she had learned and she had memorized was a typed copy of the letter that had been collected right after the war to be preserved as an act of memory. And over the course of time, the original just disappeared. And it wasn't until 2004 when Henri, who was her father, passed away that the family was cleaning out his wallet that they found the fragment folded neatly in his wallet. So you have to imagine this brother, there's a phrase in the letter that is directed directly at him that says, I hope you have better luck than me, carries the letter through his life in his wallet with him. The things we carry and the meaning they give. It's like he wanted, she told me, to have a piece of his brother with him to share through his entire life. You can just imagine him for his entire life, keeping that letter in his wallet, in his breast pocket, by his chest, by his heart, having something, just a little thing, to remember his brother by. Daniel, if there was a way that we should remember these letters, how should we remember them? Because your your passion shines through, your warmth for these letters radiates. We can see how important it is to you and, and thank you for sharing that with us. But how should we as listeners to these letters, just like so many of the French listened to them during the war, how should we remember them? I think the first step to memory, to remembering is to be exposed to them, to the emotions that they share. There's an introspective turn one might take and say, what would I write in those circumstances if it came to it? Would I have the courage to make choices that might lead me down that path? And and what would I say and to whom and why? What values underlie what I would write? And why are they important to me? So the kind of what matters to me and why But the second element is is to reach out and to see what the symbolism of these letters is for for those who we love around us. Life is busy. We are constantly doing things. The letters remind us that, that time ticks inexorably away and that we need to experience that love to the fullest, whether it's love for family or friendship, that one's one's time on on earth, and I know this sounds cliche, but is to really take advantage of life. But that taking advantage of life has a duty of memory attached to it. We, for the moment, are living in a place of imperfect freedom, but freedom nonetheless. But that could go away in an instant. And to sort of to bring us full circle back to 1940, where we began in the, the tumult of history. Some people saw it coming, but many did not. They did not think that they were going to be occupied by Nazi Germany and that this would be the beginning of a downward spiral of violence, death, and last letters. And I think many of us probably take it for granted that we're in a position of invulnerability, that what the liberties and freedoms we have are there forever, that t- today will be like, tomorrow will be like, Yesterday will be like next week. But the letters remind us that we can't take any of this for granted. And that the act of reading the letter or listening to the letters is an act of recognizing how fragile liberty is. And I was, I, this, this point was driven home when I went to a ceremony in 2002, in May 2002, at the Mont Valérien. It's a yearly ceremony, so it's like a cycle of of, of remembrance. And there are four elements of, of, of that ceremony I just want to raise. The first is I sat randomly next to an old man who was fragile, who was there alone, and I struck up a conversation. And he told me that his brother, Lucien Materon, had been executed in 1941. And he comes alone every year to the ceremony to pay homage. And I watched him throughout the ceremony alone, not interacting with anyone. And all he could say in our, in our brief conversation was that we were a family of resistance fighters. And some of us survived and my brother did not. And so that scar and that solitude is part of this history. The second element is that there was a German school class there, a, a class of high school German students who were there attending the ceremony to honor the executed. And I find that extraordinary that German high school students, that would have been unthinkable during the war years. And yet here they were 
at this ceremony, honoring the memory of fallen resistance fighters, sort of a new generation of European youth to build upon. The third element is the presence of, of the Ukrainian embassy who laid a wreath on the spot where the executions took place in the Glade, in La Clairière, to use the French term. Now, we know the context of why the Ukrainian embassy was there in May 2022, because Ukraine was invaded by Russia, and Ukrainians who used to live in freedom and liberty, who were in cafes the day before the invasion thinking this can't happen to us, are now fighting. And if you can look at some of the parallels, there's ongoing resistance, executions. Maybe there are last letters, I don't know. But the presence of the Ukrainian embassy there was a stark reminder that freedoms are never guaranteed. And the last bit was in the glade, in the sun, with the sun cascading through the giant oak trees and butterflies flying around, dancing in the sunlight someone stood up and read a last letter. And that last letter was won by Guido Broncandero. And the idea of the letter is that we shouldn't hate our enemy and that we should believe in the future possibilities of reconciliation and peace. And so I think he made the ultimate sacrifice in resisting and dying for freedoms and has the courage and bravado, if you will, to write a letter saying that I don't hate those who are about to execute me, and I love the German people of tomorrow. Wow. Daniel, that is incredible. Grasp life by both hands. Live life hard, but remember that it could be taken away in the blink of an eye. Daniel, thank you so much for your time, for sharing your research with us, for sharing these very human stories with us. Tell us, where can we read more about The Last Letters? James, the journey, it's been three years since I've been working on this project and I'm writing a book that recounts my personal encounter with these last letters uh, and the historical trajectory of, of some of these letters in their lives. And hopefully that will come out sometime soon. I'm also trying to transform it into a play, which I hope audiences will be able to see. And while I'm not on social media, if anyone wants further interaction, please write me a letter. And choose your words carefully, because as we know, those letters have many, many lives. Daniel, thank you so much for your time. You're always welcome on the Warfare Podcast. Thanks for listening. But before you go, a reminder that you can now follow along online on Twitter at HistoryHitWW2, on Instagram at James Rogers History, and on TikTok also at James Rogers History. You can also subscribe to our free Warfare Wednesdays newsletter via the link in the show notes.